In this video, I'm going to explain how the driving test, or PDA, is conducted. If you understand the criteria they mark you to, it makes it much easier to pass the driving test because you understand what is and isn't quite as important. On the daily test, you've got to take your learner's permit, your logbook. If you're doing an overseas conversion, you won't have a learner's permit, so you've got to take your ID, maybe your passport with you. You've got to be there at least 10 minutes early. You don't have to get one of the queuing tickets. The examiners will come out and call out your name. You show them all your documentation. Then they'll get you to, to go to the car, and on the way to the car, they'll say something like this. I'd now like you to follow the road ahead, unless road markings or street signs indicate otherwise, unless I ask you to turn left or right, which I'll do in plenty of good time. When you, get in, when you get to the car, jump in, put your ignition on, but don't start the engine. Put your window down so you can hear what the examiner's asking you to do. They'll ask you to signal left, signal right, brake, they'll check all your tyres, then they'll jump in the car with you and ask you to move off down the road. The driving test lasts for roughly 35 minutes. It's broken down into five sections. You go for a short drive, you do an exercise, you do another drive, you do another exercise, and then you drive back to the test centre. They're going to ask you to do two out of three possible exercises, and each exercise is made up of two manoeuvres. So this first one is called left something behind. In this exercise, you start off outside a house. The examiner asks you to remember the house. You drive off down the road, and then they say, right, can you go back to the house? So you turn the car around, that's your first manoeuvre. You go past the house, turn it around again, that's your second manoeuvre and end up back where you started. Another exercise they could get you to do is called stop for shopping. So you might start off in position A here. The examiner will ask you to do a reverse park in this car park. So you move off, you turn the car around once, go into the car park and do your reverse park. So again, two manoeuvres for that one exercise. The same exercise could be conducted differently. So here you go into the car park, you reverse park it, that's one manoeuvre, and then you forward park it, that's two manoeuvres. Don't forget if you're parked here and they ask you to forward park, you could just go straight here, or again if you're here and they want you to reverse park, you could just reverse straight back. Reverse parallel parking, you could be in position A, they'll say right, you see that orange car there? I want you to drive off down the road, turn the car around, and then reverse park next to that orange car. So you move off in A, reverse back onto this driveway, drive next to the car, and reverse parallel park behind it. So again, two manoeuvres for that one exercise. So don't forget you're going to do two out of those three exercises. That's the marking sheet they mark you on. Your first drive is marked here, your first exercise here, your next drive, next exercise, and then back to the test. Now we'll talk about the minor mistakes. So these are look behind faults. Look behind assesses whether you keep an eye on what's happening behind you as you drive. So you get one of these faults if you don't check your mirror before you slow down or brake, before you change direction, before you open your door, before you signal, before and during reversing or if you're not doing head checks at the correct time. These are signal faults. So you, signal assesses whether you make other road users aware of your intentions in a timely manner. These are some examples. You must signal for five seconds before you move off. You must signal early enough before you turn or merge or lane change. You can't cancel the signal until the manoeuvre has been completed. You must cancel the signal within three seconds of the manoeuvre being completed. So in other words, if you're doing a roundabout, you must cancel the signal after you've left that roundabout within three seconds. You can't signal the wrong way, and your signal must be correctly timed. Flow assesses your ability to drive competently in a fluid manner whilst observing and adhering to road rules. So flow is the thing that makes you look really professional. So you get a flow mark if you miss an opportunity to start a manoeuvre, you stumble or pause before parts of the manoeuvre, 
you don't change your driving style. So let's just say you're on a quiet ride and then you hit a main road and you're still going very slowly. You use an unsuitable or illegal maneuver for the, for the location. So let's just say you choose a driveway and the examiner thinks that you didn't have very good visibility uh, of the road when you were reversing out and that could be a flow mark. You inconvenience other drivers by going too slow or spending too long at intersections. You disobey road rules, you don't scan the road at an intersection, you fail to observe something. These last three are quite different from the other these um, faults. All of these first faults are all, all about going too slow and taking too long to do things. Whereas these last three are about not obeying road rules and not observing. And the reason these are flow marks is if you're not doing one of these, you're affecting someone else's flow. Movement assesses whether the car moves smoothly in the correct direction and stops accurately. So if you roll back down a hill, or if your drive is jerky, if you've got rough gear changes or you're braking late, if you travel too quickly or too slowly for parts of the maneuver and you haven't got control of the car. If you sped by 3Ks, nothing would happen. But if you sped by 5 to 10 k's, you'd get a movement mark. If you stop inaccurately, so you don't stop at a stop line, at set traffic lines maybe, or if you're too close to the car in front. Path assesses how well you steer, your road positioning and path that you take. So if you don't steer accurately for during dur manoeuvres, so let's just say you're doing a bay park and you end up on the white line, Erratic steering, so rather than have nice, smooth, consistent steering, your car's not following a nice path. Too close to road markings, not central to your lane. You adopt a position on the road not normally followed by the road users, so maybe you're cutting corners. You travel on an illegal path. Ineffective use of the steering wheel, so maybe you're freezing on the wheel, which means moving both hands in one direction or just using little tiny motions with your hands, that again could be path. Responsiveness. You're not assessed on responsiveness on your driving test. They put a line straight through this box. You can get positive marks, but they can't actually put any crosses in here. So if you're picking up positive marks, it can help you pass your driving test. Although they don't directly mark you on response, responsiveness, I think you've got a much greater chance of passing if you are driving and really driving defensively because it makes your drive feel a lot better overall. So we won't go into too much detail on that, but I do think that responsiveness is quite important on your driving test. Vehicle management assesses how well you control the vehicle. So these are some examples. If your passengers or objects aren't secured in the vehicle, if your mirrors are incorrectly adjusted, you have the wrong driving position, or maybe you can't take your steering lock off. If you ignore the vehicle instrument, so let's just say you've got a door open light coming on and you ignore it. It rains and you can't put your windscreen wipers or blowers on. You use one hand to steer, or you fan the wheel, or you dry steer, that means turning when you're not moving, or you drive with a handbrake on. These are some thoughts you can make on vehicle management in a manual car. If you coast, if you ride your clutch, if you stall it, if you over rev it, if you look at your gears, they're all vehicle management mistakes. Now, you, it's important to remember that any minor mistake can become a major mistake. So if you speed a little bit, it's a minor mistake. If you speed a lot, it would fail you. If you touch the curb, it would be a minor mistake. If you whack the curb, it will fail you. Uh, your steering lock, if you couldn't take the steering lock off for say 10 seconds, it would be a minor mistake. If you couldn't take it off at all, again, it would be a major mistake and they've got the right to fail for it. The way the form is used is every time you make a mistake, the examiner puts a cross in the box. At the end of this drive, they tick the remaining boxes. If you get less than this amount, sorry, than this amount of ticks, you fail this section. So this person's only got three ticks, one, two, three, they fail this section. If you fail one section, you're fine. If you fail two sections, then you fail. Once you finish the whole test, the examiner adds up your score coming downwards. You've got to get a minimum of three, three, five, 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 or three in any column. 
So here this student has only managed to get one, two, three, four ticks. They should have got five ticks, so therefore they fail that section. If you fail a section coming downwards, a column coming downwards, you fail the whole driving test. And the reason for that is, if you keep making the same type of mistake, obviously there's a problem with that type, that, that fall with your driving. The driving examiner will stop the driving test if one of these things happens. So if he thinks that you're not mentally or physically fit, they can stop the test. If the vehicle's not roadworthy, so if you are taking your car, make sure that it is roadworthy a couple of days before. Uh, if you've got a tyre, you can't replace it on the day, obviously, so to check it all out earlier than that. It's got to be the right type of vehicle, so if you were doing a, a car test, obviously you can't turn up on a motorbike. Um, you've got to have a centrally mounted handbrake, so a normal handbrake, you can't have a dash mounted handbrake. If your vehicle broke down, they'd stop your driving test, or if you bribed the, the examiner, you'd stop, they'd fail you, obviously, or they'd stop it. If the examiner thought that the test wasn't fair, so let's just say you got stuck in a traffic jam for the whole test, he can't assess you, so again, the failed to stop the driving test. You'll automatically fail your driving test if you do one of the following. So if you disobey any regulatory sign, yeah, so in other words, if you go through a stop sign, failing to stop at a stop sign is the most common failure point in Australia. Once you feel the car stop, you must count to two and then continue on. You can't speed, you must wear your seatbelt. Try not to ask the examiner any questions other than can you repeat that please or what did you mean. Um, you if the examiner helps you either physically or verbally, they can fail you. If you display any traffic regulation, if you fail to respond to a crisis or potential crisis, that would normally be anticipated by an experienced driver. So let's just say it was a pedestrian uh, walking out from the side of the road you should anticipate that before the examiner does. Yes, if they have to stop you, then again, they can fail you for that. If you cause a potential crisis, so you just do something dangerous. If the examiner asks you to do something and you refuse, or you can't follow reasonable direction. So if the examiner asks you to turn right and you just couldn't physically turn right for some reason, then again, they could fail you for that. I hope you found this video helpful. You can get a copy of how to pass your driving assessment from the Department of Transport where you can download it. Um, try and watch our other videos as well. Thank you.